Okay, welcome back after the break. Our next presentation will be on Kiskit, Building a Quantum Computing Community. Uh, the talk will be given by Dr. Anna Fan, uh, and she is a researcher with a passion for multidisciplinary science, education, and outreach. At IBM Quantum, Anna's mission is to drive quantum education and quantum machine learning for clients and grow the Kiskit community in Australia. There will be time for questions at the end, so please enter any uh, questions on the tab in Venulus. Thank you, and over to you, Anna. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning, and I'm talking to you all from Melbourne. I'm really looking forward to giving you all an introduction to quantum computing and what we at IBM have been doing to build an open source quantum computing community based around our software that we call Kiskit. So IBM believes that quantum computing will be a part of the future of computing. There exist crucial problems of business and societal interest, which are impossible to solve on any supercomputer today or any one that we can imagine building in the future. Um, so if we think about it, um, to make an analogy, um, think about driving a car, which is basically driving on a surface that is two-dimensional. Um, you can only go so fast, and you, for example, can't drive from New York to London unless you've got a super fancy you know, um, thing that can go across water. Um, but now consider air travel. We've taken something that is two-dimensional to the three dimensions. With this extra dimension, this sort of extra degree of freedom, we can do things which were just impossible to do with land-based travel. That's sort of the analogy that we make between uh, classical current computing and, and quantum computing. For level setting, the technology to make an analogy to classical computing, quantum computing is sort of at the stage where classical computing was in the 1940s, hence I get to show this, this lovely image of the, the Colossus uh, machine. Um, and just as the decades after the 1940s brought incredible increases to power, capacity, and ease of use to classical programmable computers, we really believe the next few years will bring the similar advances to the power and capacity of quantum computers, and hopefully much, much faster as we can really build up and use all of the knowledge that we've learned in the, the past decades in classical computing. So quantum computers promise to solve a variety of hard problems that classical computers can't. Um, it's, it's not often discussed, but there are many problems that classical computers simply cannot solve because they are just too computa uh, computationally difficult. These problems often have a uh, exponential character such that the time or size of classical computer required to solve the problem increases exponentially with the size of the problem. Meaning that for any practical size problem, it is um, impossible for classical computers to solve it. Uh, universal uh, future quantum computers promise to solve some of these problems. Um, and moreover, since quantum computing is so nascent and newer technology, we simply don't know the full range of possible problems a quantum computer can solve. Um, as quantum computing advances, we anticipate discovering many new applications. So to, to make an analogy again to sort of the history of, of current computers, uh, we think about the advent of, of uh, GPUs, so graphical um, computational units, you know, um, a few years ago, or a couple of decades ago, they were purely used um, for what their name is, you know, graphically um, creating videos um, and, and games and making that user experience uh, much more seamless to, to churn through those floating point calculations. Um, but over the past um, decade, we've really realized that GPUs can, um, those calculations can also be used in, in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and that really wasn't a use for for these um, for this hardware when they it first came out, and we're anticipating the same thing will happen with with quantum computers. And I may end up dropping the term um, QPU every so often during the presentation, and that um, uh, stands for a, a quantum um, processing unit. 
So quantum computing is all about learning how to use um, quantum mechanical principles in a completely new model of computation. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little bit of this just to give you a idea about how um, computing using quantum mechanics is, feels different um, to computing uh, using uh, classical computers. So the first principle to get used to is superposition. So this is where a quantum bit or qubit in a perfectly deterministic state um, can still behave randomly. So what does this mean? So if we look at this, these little diagrams, um, this top one on the left with the, the Q0 and the zero in those weird, weird brackets, um, if we think about that as sort of a qubit line um, with time going from left to right, um, you start at the state zero, that's what sort of the zero in the, in the little brackets means, and then we put on this special gate um, called a Hadamard gate. And this gate puts this qubit into a 50-50 um, superposition between the states 0 and 1. So if we continue to measure this qubit over and over again, 50% uh, of the time we'll get 0 and 50% of the time we'll get 1. So an analogy to this is like flipping a coin. Um, you know, 50% of the time you'll get heads, 50% of the time you get tails. But the difference between a flipping the coin exercise and this qubit is that if we then take this qubit, which is in the superposition, and put on another Hadamard gate afterward, um, because it's a deterministic state, um, we actually end up putting that qubit back into a zero state, even if it was in a one or a zero in that 50-50 beforehand. So this, this is sort of where it's different from like classical probability, where you kind of can't undo that, that, that coin flip. So the other principle, um, which is quite different from classical computing, is quantum entanglement. So qubits can be manipulated such that their state cannot be described independently of others. So an example here is uh, where you've got two qubits, so you now we've got Q0 and Q1. Um, you can put them in this, this state whereby if you look at the results, if you measure qubit zero, you know that qubit one is also going to be in the same state. So like if qubit zero is in a zero state, qubit one is also going to be in zero state, while if it's in a one state, um, qubit one is also going to be in a one state. And then on the um, bottom line, I've just shown a different example of another entanglement state where if you know that one qubit is in zero, you know that the other qubit is in one. And entanglement is a really interesting principle because to mimic quantum entanglement on a classical computer requires exponential classical resources. Um, and, and quantum computation is really the only way to access this unique resource. And this is important because as we are trying to come up with algorithms um, that, to run on these quantum computers, we really want to take advantage of their quantum mechanical properties. So we don't want to, for example, create an algorithm which doesn't take advantage of, of entanglement at all, um, because then we could just rewrite that algorithm to run on a classical computer. So if we look at this table, this sort of demonstrates the potential of, of quantum computing compared to classical computing. So if we want to represent um, a set of qubits in a fully entangled state, um, depending on the number of qubits we're trying to represent, here's a sort of the, the sort of canonical example of how many bits it would take to represent a fully entangled state. So if we're looking at two qubits, um, this will take uh, 512 bits, assuming you know 50, 64 bit precision. Um, and then if we want to just add one more qubit, you need to double that number of bits. So three qubits will take um, uh, two to the uh, 10, so you know, um, 1024 bits. If we're just looking at, if we keep doubling that for every bit that we need to add, um, you quickly see that as we go into, let's say 30 um, qubits, we then end up needing you know, 17 gigabytes um, to represent a fully entangled state across all of those 
um, qubits. And then even we go to, to sort of numbers of just in the hundreds, we end up with more atoms on the planet um, that we would need to represent that set of qubits. So what does this mean in terms of sort of practical algorithms and practical uses of these qubits? Well, one of the really interesting applications and use cases for, for quantum computing is around trying to understand the natural world better, trying to simulate um, the interactions of atoms and molecules with other, other molecules at a, at, a, at a more granular scale to be able to understand that interaction better and to, to be able to hope you know, in the future create uh, more efficient materials uh, for things like solar power generation or for catalyzing um, fertilizers or for creating better uh, enzymes for you know carbon sequestration new materials for you know lighter more efficient batteries all that all this sort of thing where um, you really want to understand what is going on at a very low chemical um, reaction to sort of really improve the efficiency of, of those types of materials or those types of processes. So for example, here we've got like a different set of interesting molecules um, and really comparing the number of classical bits needed to fully simulate what is going on in that molecule with both the atoms and all of the electrons in that molecule. So if we look at water, right, H2O, um, that already would take about, a, you know, on the order of a thousand classical bits. And you can actually simulate that using only 14 qubits. So then if we jump to something that I'm sure we all know a lot about, um, caffeine, um, just, just there, that already is actually um, really hard to simulate perfectly um, using classical computers. So we would need, you know, 10 to the 48-ish um, classical bits, while people believe would only need around 160 quantum bits to, to understand that molecule. So then we go on to looking at, you know, the, the sort of biological molecules and, and drugs, you can really see that scaling um, go exponential in the number of classical bits that we would need. Um, while we're still looking at qubits that may be reasonable in, in upcoming hardware. So a, another example of a area of interest for quantum computing is quantum machine learning. Um, so one of the applications of machine learning these days, uh, or in general, is actually like classification. You know, given a set of data, um, you know, if we look at these set of dots, you know, which ones are dark blue, which ones are light blue, um, you know, which ones are dogs, which ones are cats, um, you know, whatever we want to, the data could represent. Uh, people will usually want to classify them into to separate classes. So for ease, most classification algorithms work linearly. So you, we want to find some way to find um, some way of visualizing that data um, or representing that data such that we can find a straight line or a straight hyperplane. Um, if we're looking at multiple dimensions, to separate that data into the different classes. So if we look um, just at these light and blue dots, um, if we look at them in one dimension there, you can see that there's no single straight line that could separate them. But then if we sort of lift those, that data into two dimensions, here a parabola, you can see that there is a nice sort of um, straight line that could separate those two classes. So the idea um, in quantum machine learning is to use that extra sort of dimensionality um, of the space that the qubits give you um, via entanglement um, to increase the dimensionality of the data set you're looking at um, and I ideally identify that, that separating hyperplane. Um, and this could possibly give you an advantage compared to classical computing if that... Um, that dimensionality calculation uh, involves a lot of entanglement. Um, so here's like a interesting sort of example, like artificial data, where we're looking at these sort of scattering of, of blue and red dots. Uh, if you just look at them by eye, 
in the the left hand side of that plot there's really no obvious um classes or separating um between the the red and the blue dots um but then on the other side is sort of the the classes represented in a quantum space um so you can see how complicated that quantum space could look like uh, when you sort of merge it back to a two-dimensional space. So that's sort of yeah the all I had on the sort of motivation and use cases and applications of quantum computing. I'm happy to take questions on that at the end. Um, but really, to get to this space, um, what do we actually need to to sort of build a quantum community and a quantum workforce uh, and sort of make it reality, quantum computing, the, these use cases and applications in the future. So the we like I really see the three pillars of this is, you know, we need the hardware, you need you need um, the compute the quantum computers to actually run these algorithms on. Um, you need the uh, software and ideally that software being open source so that um, it is they are available to everybody and everybody can contribute to the the base and then because it is such a, a new technology um, we really need a education that is freely available and um, not just the the uh, cohort of people who traditionally have learned about quantum computing being sort of the, the people with physics backgrounds um, so yeah I'm going to go through sort of each of these in in sequence, um, starting with the hardware, and I just I just wanted to sort of put a put a little pin in the sand that IBM has um, quantum computing devices which are available on the cloud for anybody to use. You just need to to log on and create an account, and you can you can play with the five qubit um, computer straight away. Um, so, what does quantum computing technology or hardware actually look like, or how does it actually work? Um, if we think back historically about classical bits. Um, they came in, in multiple different formats before getting to the, the silicon transistors of today, you know, starting with electrical, or starting mechanically, to be honest, um, but then to electrical relays and, and vacuum tubes to, to now transistors. Um, for a qubit, we need some sort of a quantum mechanical two-level system that we can like manipulate to act as qubits. Um, and then we need these qubits to be able to talk to each other. Um, so there are several different um, current, like when we're trying to think of physical ways of realizing a qubit, um, we see that there's sort of a three-way trade-off between how well we can control the qubits versus how connected the qubits can be to each other. Um, and then how long the qubits can stay in the states that we want them to stay in, so that, that we call that coherence. Um, and so here are some just examples of different uh, hardware uh, technologies that people have come up with to, to realize what a qubit could be, um, from using photons to trapped ions, um, or sort of really interesting solid state defects. Um, at IBM and other companies, um, people are working on the superconducting uh, circuits, which I will go through in a little bit more detail. So these superconducting circuits um, are sort of printed on silicon wafers, so we can continue to use the fabrication facilities and methods built up over um, the decades with um, creating the current um, silicon hardware for classical computing um, with some obvious differences. So first, um, to make the qubits themselves, um, we're looking at creating what is essentially a, a um, LC circuit, but it's a damped LC circuit for those of you who know any sort of classical, I mean, so electrical engineering. So if you if you're looking at a normal inductor capacitor circuit, like in the bottom of the slide, um, the energy levels of that um, circuit are all the same. Um, so the difference between that and the superconducting qubit circuit is that um, there is a nonlinear um, device in there um, called a Josephson junction. 
Um, and that makes all the energy levels different from each other. Um, and that makes them addressable. So that means we can use sort of the lowest energy state as our zero state for the qubit, and then the first energy level as the um, sort of the one state of the qubit. Um, and then, you know, we're looking at approximately five gigahertz um, energy difference between them, meaning they're around 240-ish millikelvin. So each of the qubits will have a slightly different energy level um, between that, that zero state and the first state, and that makes, makes them so that they can be individual qubits, and then we can address them um, using sort of microwave uh, input and output and readout, so that, you know, when we throw in a microwave line of, you know, let's say 240, uh, that, at, at that five gigahertz, it knows exactly which qubit we need to talk to. Um, so um, I mentioned a very low temperature just then, 240 millikelvin. Um, and I've also mentioned the word superconducting, um, which means that these things are quite complicated in terms of the engineering environment they sit in. Um, there's these chips with the superconducting qubits and the microwave resonators used for um, talking the qubits to each other, as well as the microwave resonators used to, to talk the input and output. Um, so these are uh, put in the middle of a printed circuit board, and they need to run at approximately 15 millikelvin. Um, to get that superconducting circuit to, to exhibit that, um, that energy differential that we need um, to, to use them as qubits. Um, so these little chips sit at the bottom of this super fancy fridge, which is called a dilution refrigerator, um, uh, where the top is sort of 40, 40 Kelvin, and then the bottom is at this um, 15 millikelvin. And then you can see all the, the super fancy sort of lie, um, infrastructure there for readout, amplification, um, input, and all, all that sort of thing. And then connected to that is a whole set of, outside the fridge, um, room temperature microwave electronics. Um, and then of course, um, depending on the experimental setup, you know, that can be connected to an uh, internet machine, so then, then um, all of us outside that lab can then use these devices. Um, so then um, just in, in terms of evolution, the first qubit device that we put on the cloud had five qubits. Um, and you can see sort of the, the gradual increase of this over time um, until sort of uh, last year, we released a 127 qubit device, which our partners uh, and clients can use. And we have a roadmap sort of moving up from there to a thousand qubits. Um, by the end of, of 2023 with the goal to, you know, trying to get to some sort of device that looks like it has more than a million qubits or so. In terms of space, right, um, so this is sort of the inside of one of those um, current dilution refrigerators, you know, you can sort of hug it, um, but we're envisioning these like million qubit devices to be in sort of this, what looks like a teleportation device that someone can actually stand in, it's sort of two meters wide and three meters tall. Um, so it, it's, it's very cool, um, literally as well. Uh, so if we look at these devices, um, we're really thinking about um, how many qubits they have, the quality of the qubits um, in terms of the errors that they have on them. And it's important to also think about the circuits that can run per unit time on them um, in terms of sort of performance metrics, if we're you know, wanting to compare the different types of technologies that I showed a little bit earlier. So that's all I had on the hardware, um, but now uh, moving on to the software. So as well as open access to um, some of our devices online, uh, we also have provided open source software via our Qiskit framework. This is written in Python, which only, not only allows developers access the systems, but provides the source code um, so that people don't have to learn like a totally new different language. Um, and it also really helps sort of integrate current sort of workflows with possible future quantum computing workflows. So what does programming a quantum computer actually look like? So classical bits, they're, you know, one or zero, or if I'd like to make an analogy, they can be like north or south. So if we look, think about the state of a qubit, 
it can be an uh, it can be thought of as an arbitrary point on the surface of a sphere. So if we map that back to a bit, let's say zero is north and and say one is south, and that's all you can get to in a classical bit. But on a quantum bit, you can sort of access all of the areas of that sphere. So you can sort of you know twiddle the knobs to say that I want um, my qubit to be pointing at Melbourne, right, rather than just zero north or south. And so how do you get your qubit to do that? Well, classically, if you wanted something to be in zero or one, you create, you know, a set of one bit gates um, for that one bit, or, you know, a set of two bit gates for, you know, two bits or multiple bits. So that's the same thing for quantum computing. So um, obviously our one qubit gates are a little bit more complicated because the idea is to try to um, move that qubit state sort of around that surface of the sphere. And similarly, we have two qubit gates, which um, where the state of the qubit depends on this um, first qubit. Um, the biggest difference uh, when we're thinking about uh, these gates in quantum computing is that because of quantum mechanics, they have to be reversible. Um, so th this is quite a different way of thinking about how to create these circuits. So they, they are just being a lot longer, right? So if you think about and um, a sort of an OR circuit, um, you don't know, like, you know, if you have a one at the end of that OR circuit, you don't know which bit was in zero or which bit was in one. You've actually lost um, that piece of information and it's not reversible. Whereas all of the Q, uh, two qubit gates are actually reversible, just as a um, aside. So if you think about um, programming a quantum computer, clearly we don't program um, computers these days at the level of, of, of those electronic gates. Um, we've got low language, low level programming languages, as well as high level programming languages. And that's sort of where we want to get to in, in quantum computing as well. People have been really thinking about what does a quantum circuit look like? Um, what is the intermediate representation between sort of a high level language like Python and the low le level um, circuit language. So there's multiple different groups out there coming up with different representations, um, seeing if we can standardize them and also putting them in practice to see if they're actually um, fit for purpose uh, as well. And so um, Kiskit and OpenChasm, um, which is an in intermediate representation, is, is part of that. So Kiskit, like I mentioned, is an open source software development kit for working with quantum computers. Um, at the level of sort of microwave pulses, as well as circuits, um, as well as high level um, application modules. So you can use Qiskit to sort of run a quantum uh, machine learning algorithm, as well as create the microwave pulses you might want to, um, you know, if you want to play with what um, the qubits at the gate level. Um, and Qiskit is open source, so has been adopted um, not um, by other hardware platforms and companies um, such as Honeywell, um, AQT, and INQ to access their hardware as well. So alongside the um, sort of hardware roadmap, which I showed earlier in terms of trying to get to um, this year releasing that 127 qubit device and trying to get to the 1000 qubit devices in a couple of years. We also have a um, development roadmap whereby the idea is to move from um, users creating circuits to really think about pre-built circuit libraries on top of that with some pre-built quantum and classical integration and being able to run um, programs on quantum computers in sort of dockerized um, containers on virtual machines and really closely integrating the classical computers and the quantum computers in the future um, and really making that development frictionless. Um, so hopefully in the future when, when people are learning about how to program a quantum computer, we're not teaching people about superposition and, and entanglement and, and circuits right from the get-go. Obviously people want to know because that's, what's me that's what is, makes um, classical computing and quantum computing different, um, but it's not what they need to fully and deeply understand the maths behind um, 
how a qubit is represented to actually program it, which is sort of a little bit where like we're really at the transition at the moment in, in making um, quantum computing really accessible for those without strong um, maths backgrounds. And that, that's really sort of the third tranche of this, 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 this three-legged stool, um, really educating um, and, you know, you can put hardware out there and you can put software out there, but if nobody actually knows how to, to use it or write it, um, that it's really kind of useless. So that, that's sort of um, the reason why the education is so important to this. Um, and having a, a really friendly community where people are willing to help others along their journeys to, to quantum computing as well. So we've got a lot of, a lot of educational content out there um, from sort of the, our online, the, our online um, composer and quantum lab where you don't have to install anything on your computer anymore to um, run um, create your own circuits and run them on a quantum computer or, or write Qiskit code in an online Jupyter lab environment and, and send that to our devices. We also have, um, and I've actually contributed to, uh, some inter our interactive um, textbook, um, which is, we have one that is really um, supposed to be sort of a guide to an undergraduate or postgraduate uh, quantum computing course, but we've also got um, and we're been creating introductory courses. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where we have a series about, you know, um, live streams of public lectures for people to keep up with the sort of research level of quantum computing, but as well, um, as well a whole series uh, based on just learning how to program a quantum computer, you know, booting up Qiskit, installing it, how, how to, what, what, what do next? Um, yeah. And alongside that, we also do events, we have documentation. Um, so I'm just going to flip through a few examples of, of those now. So here is sort of our introductory, um, online introductory course. You know, it's a three-level course aimed at people from like technical as well as non-technical backgrounds. So this is um, something that we created after we realized the textbook was a little too, um, too high level. Um, well, to assume too much maths um, background because this, yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's meant as a now, like, obvious, it's, it's meant as it says, a university quantum algorithms course complement. So it does assume a lot of linear algebra. Um, so, yeah, separating out sort of that, that non-technical introductory course to sort of uh, a textbook was what we realized was missing in, in sort of our document, our educational material moving forward. So the other things that we do is we run events where we, we try to educate people um, on how to use quantum computing. So for the past couple of years, because of the pandemic, we've been running um, global summer schools completely online. They're two weeks in the Northern Hemisphere summer. Um, uh, in 2020, it was all around introduction to quantum computing and quantum hardware. Last year, we ran a very, very quick deep dive into um, quantum machine learning um, this year. Um, stay tuned. It's, uh, let's see, registrations should be open sort of May-ish. Um, and I can give you a little bit of a hint on, it will be a, a different topic from, from the other two. So it will be a deep dive into a different topic than that was covered previously. And all of the lectures and labs from the previous summer schools are available online from kiskit.org as well. Um, so just some example, uh, some numbers from our last summer school. So we had uh, 20 live lectures and, and five lab exercises that people needed to complete to get a, the certificate at the end of the summer school. Um, it was completely free. And we had 5,000 um, people register from over 100 countries um, worldwide. And on top of that, we also um, trained up about 100 mentors to help these thousands of students get through that course material. And it was really, really great because I was like sitting on that Discord. Um, the, we actually had uh, people setting up um, discords across different languages so that people could talk to each other and ask questions in the language that was most comfortable for them to ask questions in. Um, so that was really nice to see that um, people were getting the support in the language that they were most um, comfortable asking for support in. They didn't always have to switch to uh, English as well as trying to learn quantum computing at the same time. So if people don't have two-week um, intensive set times to, to 
um, go through a summer school. We also run uh, multiple um, Kiskit challenges across the year. So these are themed competitive programming challenges um, held multiple times a year. There's usually one in like May and, and one in October, November-ish, um, spring and fall that they um, sort of Northern, Hef Northern Hemisphere wise. Um, so here's sort of an example of last year's one from the end of October. Um, it was all themed around sort of applications of quantum computing. Um, so there was a set of challenges uh, around different applications of quantum computing from finance, simulation, uh, machine learning, and optimization. And they in, um, got harder and harder and harder. And so uh, we see the uh, people who have just stepped in um, really being able to do that first challenge, which is um, really based at that beginner level. Um, and then sort of, as they get more difficult, we can see people um, trying to complete or, or um, getting better at completing the harder challenges. And it's really nice to see people coming back from previous challenges and then and, and going to a, a, the next challenge and seeing that they can um, progress further as their knowledge of quantum computing um, in, ev evolves as well. So for example, um, yeah, for this particular challenge last October, we had about 3,000 registered applicants, um, about 1,000 of which um, submitted at least one exercise uh, from that first challenge. Um, and then around uh, 600 or so um, completed that final, um, or completed all four challenges. So different, there are obviously different ways to contribute to the open source community. Um, there's the uh, obvious one of um, code. We've got three different sort of GitHub organizations, Kiskit Basic, Kiskit Community, and Kiskit Partners, where the partners are the ones that um, can use Kiskit to access different types of hardware. Um, and I really think a really nice one that we have is translations. Um, so you can see that there are different translation um, group efforts going on to translate the Kiskit documentation and textbook into various different languages. Some of these are sort of IBM, um, they have IBM people sort of pushing them. Um, so you have like a, a really great team in Japan who have been re really working on, on translating that all. But then some of these groups are purely community run. Um, the Beng like the Indian languages ones, the Tamil and the, the Bengali, you can see that they're almost 90, 90 like almost 100% fully translated into these languages. And that has been a pure community um, effort. And it's really great to see people people doing that work and, and broadening that access, not just to the physical devices, but learning about quantum computing as well. Um, so we also have a Kiskit Slack um, workspace where people can talk to each other, where um, people ask questions, as well as Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow. Um, and if people um, are really super interested in um, contributing to the community, we have an advocate program which provides people with extra mentorship and projects and, and networking and really being like sort of not core um, Kiskit developers, um, but really connected to that internal team within IBM um, and being able to, to grow that um, community and, and being part of that um, group that really pushes where the, the future of the open source project goes. Alongside that, um, we've all, uh, to become like a Kiskit advocate, one of the things that you need to prove is that you know how to program in Kiskit. Um, and one of the things that we do have is a certification um, that opened up uh, last year. So yeah, that, that's um, something people can do. It's pretty exciting to you know, like have something to sort of aim towards if, if um, that's something that people are interested in doing. So yeah, um, just to flip through sort of some of the different things I've shown here in terms of the community. Uh, Kiskit.org is, is where it all starts. Um, from there, you can join the Kiskit Slack. You can get links to the, the textbook and the YouTube. Um, this, uh, it's also following the Twitter. Kiskit Twitter is probably the best way to find out about all the challenges and events and the summer schools. And then if people um, are super interested and have contributed to the community and have proven themselves to be able to develop in Kiskit, uh, they can become a, a Kiskit advocate. Um, and thank you. And I think I've left like five-ish minutes to answer any questions that came up during the talk.
Okay, thank you, Anna, for such a wonderful introduction to a, a new world for many, including me. Yes, indeed, we have a few questions. Uh, four questions have come in on the chat. Uh, so I can give you the first one. Uh, is quantum machine learning only useful for working on problems with quantum behavior? Would you ever use it for classical problems? That's actually one of the, like that, that is actually the key question in um, the research community around quantum machine learning at the moment. Um, so if people have shown advantage in using um, quantum machine learning for quantum-ish type data, um, and lots of people are looking at using um, quantum machine learning for classical types of data sets. Um, and it's still an open question and a very interesting open question at that. Um, there's a couple of interesting papers, I believe that are online, so uh, where people have used quantum machine learning to look at electronic health records um, or or data off the Large Hadron Collider um, in terms of particle physics data. Uh, but yeah, it, it's yeah, open question. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Uh, what microwave frequencies are used? Uh, would like to see more of the room temperature signal chain. Ah, sure. So I actually don't know um, too much about the hardware at that level. Um, I've really reached into the the quantum computing as sort of on that um, Kiskit level side. So that is something I would have to look up. Um, and maybe you could the person who's asking the question could probably find that information better than me. So I know we have a lot of um, information out there around sort of that on the ibm.com slash quantum computing website as well as various papers. I yeah that, that is really not my area of um, speciality. Okay, the third question. Uh, is there research being undertaken to discover the social questions and challenges these new technologies may pose to each of us? Yes, there's actually a group um, looking at sort of the ethical um, consequences of quantum computing. Um, and yeah, the societal impacts of um, such here in Australia. Um, I think they're based out ooh, of Queensland. Um, so yeah, people are definitely looking into that and, and groups um, in Australia as well. Great. Uh, would like to connect with the uh, Bengali community on quantum computing contribute. What needs to be done? Sure. Um, so the best way to connect with the translation communities um, on uh, if you join the Kiskit Slack workspace, there's a channel for Kiskit localization, which is where all the discussion around the translations happen. I'm hoping that that makes sense enough for the question um, questioner. OK, and the final question for today. Uh, does reversibility of quantum functions make it difficult to implement algorithms that discard information? Um, it does. Like it, it doesn't. It's just more a different way of thinking about how you need to compute. So it's more thinking that um, you know when you're creating an adder, um, usually when you do that classically. Um, you need a certain number of bits. If you're then trying to do the same thing quantum mechanically, you may just need more qubits to sort of um, think about building that algorithm up from the circuit level. And that, that's also another way of thinking about it. Because of the difference between quantum computing and classical computing, it doesn't make sense to go, okay, I can do something in classical computing, I'm just going to do the same thing. In quantum computing, it's really thinking about, well, these are the things that make quantum computing different. Um, how do I write an algorithm um, exploiting these differences? Um, I know that's sort of a, a not a direct answer to the question, um, but these the algorithms can be written. Um, that reversibility is more of a constraint on how you're writing um, the, the algorithms themselves. So you can discard information. Um, by not looking at it again. Um, it just means the way you're writing that algorithm is going to be different. Okay, thank you. And it seems that the answer to all the other questions is to go to kiskit.org. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. And 
Uh, that's it until our lunch break now, and we have another session at 1.30 in this room. Thank you all.